Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April and I'm back doing what I do best um, and what I know and that's Bible studies. Um, today I'm not really going to do a Bible study but there is one sort of in the video when we go to church. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I'm going to give a life update because it's been a while um, since I've given you know, a, a really extensive life update. So I'm going to start with my brother. He was with me for about seven months, but he was with one of my sisters in Indiana for over a year, I think like 15, 14 or 15 months with her. And he has gradually been, um, uh, has, it's been harder for him to walk just gradually over the years. And it's just kind of happened. And we didn't really know, you know, why he thought that, um, he said that he fell off a roof 20 years ago and hit his, um, tailbone. And he thought that's what had, you know, it had pinched a nerve or something. And, you know, he just wasn't too worried about it. Um, he had this, um, hernia that we were worried about before we were worried about that. Um, three, three or four years ago, he had this hernia and, um, we all pulled together. He was living at this place where people all pulled together and we put the money together for him to have hernia surgery. And um, so that was fixed. And we thought maybe that had something to do with the way he was walking. But after he got the surgery, um, then his, his he, that was fixed. But then his leg kind of got worse and it's his left leg. And so, um, I, I had gotten him a cane because I'm like, I think you could walk better with this cane. And, and he did. So before he went to my sister's, he was here and I had gotten him the cane and he was walking really well with that. Um, we, we didn't understand why his, his leg would just kind of like, it just would like kind of do this. And, um, you know, no one knew why. And, he hadn't worked in a while, so he didn't have insurance. And so he wasn't going to get checked out at the doctor. He hadn't been to the doctor in like a long time. So then when he came back here from my sister's about a year later, his leg got worse and worse to where now he can't really go upstairs, you know, things like that. And I got him when he was here, I got him a walker because I said, well, I think that'll be you know, better for you in the house. He said, I don't want to use that. I'm I feel like an old man. And I'm like, well, just use it at the house because that way you can get around better. And he really did. He loved it. I got him this little tray and he could come in the kitchen, load up his little tray and then go back to his room. And, um, but so I got him on insurance back in the spring. And so I started taking him to appointments and, the doctor, you know, not having seen this guy, never had, you know, doesn't know any of his history, um, started, you know, little by little doing different things. So first they did like, they thought it was his back. So they did two MRIs on his back, um, you know, the lower back and then this and then the neck. And I mean, he had so many MRIs, several MRIs and they all would come back it's okay. One of them came back and said that he had a, a, a stenosis. Um, he did have a stenosis in his back, but in the meantime, um, I had taken him to his PCP and I said, I had, I had sent him a private message and I said, you know, I'm noticing a lot of things like he's, he'll, he'll drop things. Um, his memory, just different things. I said, um, you know, in my note and you know, he's only 54. So it's like the doctor was kind of like, what, you know? And, um, so they gave him this cognitive test and the doctor, um, was just questioning me, why did you want these tests done? And I said, I, I told him what was going on. Um, and you know, he was only seen him twice, so he didn't really know. And we have to wheel him in, in a wheelchair because, um, it would take him, a long time to get even from the car to inside. It would take him probably 10, 15 minutes um, because he's kind of dragging one leg as he walks with the other leg. So anyway, this whole thing and um, 
so the doctor said, well, why don't we do a brain scan? And let's just see, you know, because the MRIs, yes, there's a stenosis, but I don't know if that would cause all of this. So in the meantime, long story short, um, he, we decided that it would be a good thing for him to go to, go to one of his friend's houses. And so um, we're getting him prepared. And I, I decided because I took off work that day. So every time I take him to the doctor and stuff, I have to take off work. You know, um, he can't drive himself. I mean, he could, but he doesn't have, he has this big, huge ambulance thing that he can't park here because of the HOA. And anyway, he doesn't use it. So when he's here, we have to drive him everywhere. So I have to take off work. And so I thought, well, let me just stack all of this in the same day. So he had two MRIs to do. I think one was his neck and one was the brain scan. And, um, and then I was going to take him to his friends right after that. And I said, you know, they'll just do all of this in one day. And then Wesley was going to come with us and help us take all of his stuff. So I do that. I get off work. I come here. I get him. We load up. We go to the hospital, one of the hospitals over here, um, that we actually hadn't done an MRI there before. We always did them somewhere else, but it's hard to get into MRI. Like it's just, you sometimes have to wait a couple months. So this whole process was like six months, you know? And, um, <clears throat> so we get there, we do, did the, the MRI, the brain scan, and we're on our way to his friends. And literally, his friend was like an hour away. So about 30 minutes into our drive, I get this phone call from the doctor. And I thought it was the doctor trying to talk to me about an upcoming appointment that I had. So I didn't answer it. Well, they called right back. And I thought, well, that's odd. The schedulers don't usually call right back. So I answered it. It's his PCP, which they don't usually call. It, um, they don't usually call you. It's usually a scheduler or a nurse, you know. And he goes, April, um, and they know that I am, I am his sister and I'm helping him with all this so that I can talk to them about this. They already know that. Um, and he's like, April, um, you know, I'm sitting here looking at your brother's brain scan. And I said, really? We just did it literally like 20 minutes ago, you know, maybe 30. And I guess he gets it immediately. So he said, yes, I'm sitting here looking at his brain scan. And he goes, it's, I heard him say it's a mess. And I thought, it's a mess. What does that mean? You know, like, like, he, what is he seeing in this scan? You know, and he, and he goes, no, it's MS. And I said, oh, what? And he goes, yes, your brother definitively, definitely has multiple sclerosis. And I was just completely floored. And I said, what, what? Because no one in our family has that. It was not on my radar map. We thought that maybe he had had a few strokes because my mom did have a few strokes like six years before she got cancer. And so I thought he had had some strokes and that's what was causing this, you know, but he didn't have it checked out. He goes, no, um, we can see this on the brain scan and it, it shows MS. And I said, oh my gosh, I said, I'm going to have to break this news to him. And so the doctor's telling me what this means. And, you know, it's, it's something that attacks the nerves in your body. And, and he goes, the doctor said, April, it ex literally explains everything that you were telling me that was happening because now he's losing dexterity in his left hand. He was telling me, and he, had, we'd gone to a neurologist. He, you know, done all these things. And, um, he goes, it, it explains everything, all the symptoms. This, this is what makes complete sense, but it was not on any of our radar maps. It just was out of the blue. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to break the news to him. I said, actually, he's sitting right next to me. And the doctor says, let me talk to him. And so I give the phone to Michael and the doctor tells him the whole thing. And so after the phone call, I was like, oh my gosh, Michael, how do you feel? And he goes, 
He goes, oh, I feel about the same. I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. And now I have a name for it. I mean, he, my brother is hysterical. He is hysterical. Um, and so, yeah, it was a little bit jarring. Like what, you know, what does this mean? And he was asking the doctor, like, is there a cure? And no, there's no cure for it. And so the next step is to go to this neurosurgeon who is going to um, tell us what stage of MS he is in because there are stages and he probably has had this for many, many years without realizing it. Um, and so I don't know what stage he's in and then we can hopefully, you know, get him on disability. And I mean, he's, he's disabled. He cannot work. He, um, it's just, it's anyway, I can't go into too much more detail. Um, this is a long story, but anyway, so we have a diagnosis. Um, we know why these things have happened now and, um, he understands that he's okay with it. I mean, he's not, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing that anybody would, would, would do somersaults over like, oh yeah, I have MS, you know? Um, but so because it hasn't been treated all these years, um, the fact that his leg is not working may probably will not get back to where it could had he had rehab, had he had the right medicine and had he, you know, been treated all along, his leg may not have gotten to where it got. So the neurosurgeon is going to explain all that to, to us and I'll, I'll update you. That's in October. That's actually coming up in like a week and a half and we'll know more. We'll know what stage he's in. We'll know how much rehab he can get, the treatment and all of that. So, okay, on to the next update. Um, I had already updated in my other video about my, my school and how many terms I have left. Um, so the January one is coming up, excited about that. Um, this trip that we're going on, I'll have to update you on that later. Um, and then, but, so I had um, done this interview with one of the um, administrators at a college here and he was going to hire me to teach um, a couple of classes. Well, that was his last year at that college. He ended up moving. He got another job somewhere out of state in another state at another Christian college and he's now there. Well, um, one of the other chaplains that I know knows him and um, he was talking to him and he said, well, I want to hire you and April to both teach, um, teach on our online, uh, courses. And so, well, this is Chaplain Steve. So Chaplain Steve has a doctor of ministry and he already teaches online for some other colleges. But so he gave me that update that, that information that, um, I am, he's going to hopefully have us teaching online for next semester. And I said, well, that's perfect. Cause I wasn't really ready right now anyway to do that, but I probably will be by then. Um, another update in about eight weeks, I'm going to see one of the wonders of the world. I'm not going to let anyone know where I'm going and, which wonder the world it is, because I'm going to vlog it. Um, something that I've, you know, always dreamed of seeing and, you know, never have, but it's going to be really cool. It'll be a religious thing, have a religious bent to it, like everything I do. <laughs> so I'm going to do that in November. Hopefully, you know, things don't fall apart in the world. Um, one of the reasons I'm canning is because I know that we need to prepare for things that are happening in the world right now. We're in a very precarious time in, um, in history. And so I know that there's a lot of things that can happen. I mean, canning has never been on my radar. It is really fun though. It is really cool. Like you do this canning and then you have, it's, it's very rewarding. You have all this 
you know, shelf stable food that you can keep and for a year and a half if you need it. But um, I do listen to a lot of prophets and I don't want to say too much about that because I want to do a video on prophecy and what it means. But um, God speaks through his prophets. And so you have to be very careful on which ones you listen to because there's uh, prophets on YouTube right now are a dime a dozen. And I don't call myself a prophet. I have some prophetic in me, but I do not have, there's something called the office of a prophet where you have this anointing and mantle and this whole thing. And, you know, that's, I don't have that. I do have some prophetic in me. Um, I do often get um, words of knowledge or knowing about something. Um, and maybe I'll talk about that in my other video too, but I listen to prophets. You have to find the ones that are legit. Um, but they're saying that we're going into some rough times ahead. So I'm trying to be prepared. I don't want to be like Uber, you know, stressed about it and, you know, try to be in a bunker and, you know, all of that. But I do want to prepare, you know, we have a lot of people here and, so, um, so I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll do what I can, you know, buy water and, you know, have extra food and cans. Like I buy canned food anyway, but this isn't really canned. It's really in a jar. Um, and it lasts a long time. And so when I had gone to, um, can this strawberry jam with my mentor, um, this is some of what we made. It is so good. I mean, I was skeptical. I'm like, how much better can it be than what you can buy? But it is so good. I mean, it's delicious. And so that was a really fun thing. And then I canned my own grape jam just like yesterday. And, um, it hasn't set up yet. It's still a little bit liquidy. So I don't know if I, I think it'll be okay. It says it needs 24 to 48 hours to, to gel. Um, but so I did that yesterday. I did not film that. Um, after my filming debacle the other day <laughs> when I was doing my other canning project, my idea with that video was that I was going to make it a video on prayer and I was going to show how you can pray while you're doing other things and you're doing other projects. So I will do that another day, but that one kind of bombed and I thought, well, this is just going to be like a, you know, funny video now. Like there's nothing I can do um, because you have to do so much prep. And my, my mentor said, April, if I had known you were going to take on a big project like that for your first canning, project of your own, I would have discouraged you from doing that because what I wanted to do is in this canning book that I bought, um, and at some videos that I watched, there's this thing called a meal in a jar. And that's what I wanted to can. I didn't want to do like all these veggies and, you know, just green beans or just this or that. I wanted a whole meal in a jar. Well, that is one of the most labor intensive and hardest things to can because you have to have all of these ingredients prepped. So if you're just going to can green beans, then that's all you need. You need the green beans and the seasonings, but I wanted to do meal in a jar. So it required potatoes, carrots, celery, onions, um, garlic, you know, <laughs> I mean, the, it was just like, oh my God. And my, and my mentor said, well, next time you do a project like that, you prep the day before. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So these people that do the videos on it, they, they know what to do when. And so when they start the video, they're already prepped, you know, where I wasn't. Um, but so this is the first meal in a jar that I did. It's pot roast in a jar. You didn't even see me doing the meat part. Um, and you didn't see me putting the stuff in the cans or anything, but this is pot roast in a jar, which this can feed two people one meal. So it's potatoes, carrots, celery. Um, it's, it's a meat and it's shelf stable. So I'm like, okay, this is awesome. I love this meal in a jar thing.
And then the next day, I will make a video out of that too. The next day, I still had so many potatoes and carrots and celery left. And I had bought some of these rotisserie chickens because I heard that was a good way to do it where you don't even have to cook the chicken. And anyway, so then I made the next day, I made um, chicken, chicken and potatoes in a jar. So this does not have carrots. It just has chicken potatoes it's rotisserie chicken um, with potatoes onions garlic you know and all the seasonings um, and then you have to have a lot of broth you got you have to put broth in, I mean it is a long process um, and then so then after that I wanted to make something that was just one ingredient <laughs> where I didn't have to prep so I canned green bean or pinto beans um, last weekend so these are just pinto beans and you know you can just make rice and have beans I mean I love just rice and beans by itself you don't even have to have a meat this is not fat in there it's just something that happens when you can beans it looks like that um, so I have been trying to prep for all of these, you know, end time things that are happening. And I just want to be as prepared as I possibly can. I don't want to kind of go crazy with it. I mean, I was going to, I actually kind of did go a little crazy with it. Um, I bought these two big cabinets where I could store everything and they're in boxes in the garage because my handyman hasn't had time to put them together. And I was going to, put all my cans in there. Well, then I realized that your cans cannot be in the garage. They have to be in climate controlled environment. So now I have to find a place in my home and I only have so much um, space in the pantry. I already have that filled. So I'm going to have to take over one of the kids closets or something and to put all these cans. Um, but so if you were making that, um, like we don't have a generator, but we do have a power, what is it? Power station source thing where you can plug things into. And so I bought these little, um, burners, stove burners, just two of them. So you could just heat something like this up if you had to, and then eat it. And then, um, I mean, I like to do different things like that because my job as a ICU chaplain can be very heavy. Um, you know, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to do a day in the life of a chaplain so that you can see, and I'm just going to write it out, things that I do and share that one day, but it can be very heavy. Like all, most of the code blues that come in and things like that, they're on my floors. I know how to not let it bother me. Like I'm just kind of built for it. So it doesn't do like some people are like, how do you do that job? You know, I just couldn't do it. And it's so sad and all that. And it's just, it's not really to me. It's just, I don't know. I'll explain that in my other video. So I like to do things like this on the weekends that kind of give my mind a break. And sometimes I, I don't even go to church because I am, that's what I do all day. You know, this is my, this is my job. I, um, my counselor, um, called me a professional Christian. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm a professional Christian. Like this is what I do all day, day in and day out. And so I just need a break sometimes. And so I'll do things like I made this calendula salve, this lady that I watch, um, she is on a homestead and well she moved to a homestead this is what she wanted to do and she has this huge garden she literally plants everything harvests it and then cans it okay so like this is nothing <laughs> what i just did you know imagine planting it you know watching it grow making sure everything all of the conditions are right for what you're 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 growing and then harvesting it and then planting it so when she does like a harvest um she harvests like a ton of it like all the tomatoes like i just watched her do this video on all the tomatoes she harvested it was like 
80 pounds of tomatoes or something like that. And it's an all day affair just to do marinara sauce for one year. So she does enough for a whole year. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I have these little arrow gardens and I do little herbs, but I'm not trying to have this huge garden outside where I go out and like plant everything. And I mean, I think I would like that, but it's just, it's not my thing. Like this is my thing, what I'm doing right now. You know, um, I love doing Bible studies. I love, this is what I want to do my YouTube about and why I don't do other videos, but it's fun to incorporate them here and there. But I'm, I watched her make this calendula salve and you can look that up. It's like, it's this flower, um, it, it's a plant and you have to have um, infused oil, calendula infused oil to make the salve. So I bought the oil, I made the salve, and then I forgot to put, you're supposed to put essential oils in there to make it smell really good. But it turned out really well. And I have like, I don't know, six of these and I was giving them away to people and you can put it on cuts and I like it for my lips because I don't like dry lips. And so I've been using it for that. Um, but I want to do it again because I need to put the essential oil in it so it'll smell good. But I infused my own calendula. So I bought the flowers. I put, I filled this with olive oil and that's what they say to do. So I'm infusing my own oil. This takes six weeks to infuse. And I think it's been out there about that long. I didn't put the date on it, of course. Um, but I think this is ready to do. So maybe next week. But you just strain out all the calendula flowers. And then you can make your salve with it. So I like to do things like that on the weekend. That kind of take my mind off of what I do all day during the week. And then I also made this sourdough starter. This is like my fourth starter that I've made. Something always happens to my starter or in the past it has, I don't want to say that it's happening now. I think this one's going to be good, but um, they are very temperamental, these sourdough starters, because I want to make sourdough bread because it's a fermented food and it's very good for you and all this stuff. So as you can see, I'm not like Miss um, Health Food, you know, whatever. I don't, that's not my thing either. Like I'm not, I'm not the, you know, health food, health nut person. I'm just not, it's just not my thing. I don't care, just whatever kind of food, you know, just cook it up and eat it. Like, I, I don't know. I I do like certain things and I do get into a few little things like right now I'm making protein balls um, that are peanut butter and oats and chia seeds and flax seed and so I am doing that because I'm trying to incorporate more protein into my diet because I am on a lose weight kick. That is one of the things that was really irritating to me about the video that I did the other day is how I do not like my appearance at the moment, but I also was wearing a very tight, not very tight, but it, a tighter shirt that showed everything. And the camera does add 10 pounds. So let's remember that. <laughs> but um, I have started my weight loss thing again because I'm going on vacation and I haven't been on vacation in a while because I have been saving up all of my PTO this has been a thing. I've been saving up all my PTO for my classes because it's two weeks at a time. That's a lot of days. That's 10 days twice a year. So I needed 20 days a year to go to my classes. So I've been saving up every, every PTO, every hour that I had. I was even working holidays and saving up my PTO that way by not taking PTO for the holidays. And I am just so done doing that. I am just so tired. I did that for like a year and a half for my first three sets of classes. And I just decided I'm not doing that this year. I am going on vacation. And um, I only have one set of classes left. And I'm just going to have to take leave for either the vacation or the classes. I don't know which, but I've already decided that. I'm just kind of, I'm going to burnout if I if I continue on this 
path, you know. So anyway, um, my pastor in Costa Rica invited me to come and do some min women's ministry with his wife. Um, I don't know when that is, and I don't know if I'll be able to go because I have this other vacation plan, but in the future, I hope to do that. Um, I, you know, he wants me to go to his church and be like one of the speakers, and that would be amazing. I've had a lot of things happen with my rental properties. Um, when I was in um, class this last June, I'm sitting in class and I get these photos of this tree that has fallen at one of my rental properties. There was a storm. <clears throat> we always have storms, but I don't think there was a storm. I think the, the tree just fell. I don't really know, but it missed the house by a few feet. Anyway, it was this big thing. It did hit the shed. So the shed had a hole in it. And I'm sitting here in class going, okay, um, how do I deal with this? So the tenant, I know her from college. So you know, it was, it, she's easy to talk to and she helps out with a lot of things. And she's like, let me find a guy that can come and cut all the limbs. And, you know, I'm just like, oh my gosh. So long story short, four or five of those trees were rotted out by the back fence. So they were all going to fall. And I'm just like, really? This house has had, I had, um, I had three single guys living there. And my friend is like, those guys didn't do anything. Everything's a wreck in this house. And, you know, everything needs to be redone. Like I had to do redo the electrical. That was about $3,000. Um, I think I just said that in another video. But then this tree thing was like $3,000 um, to chop down all these trees and whatever. And I'm just like, oh my God. So that was another thing with the rental. And then there was something with the plumbing. There was another thing. And I'm just like, I asked my friend, like, would you like to buy this house? Because I don't, I, I do not enjoy being a landlord. I am not the best landlord because my compassion comes out too much. And people will say to me, me, shouldn't you charge more and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, well, things are tough right now for people and I just don't want to be that person and I want people to be able to afford you know things and so I am the worst landlord I don't even like being a landlord um I haven't raised the rent on my tenants there that have been there like two years in the other house I'm just like whatever it's fine <laughs> and um so I'm very, I'm just very easygoing with it. Um, so I've contemplated selling both of them and just being done. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. We will see. So my mentor that you saw in, in two videos, um, the one where we did our, our uh, Judith Strong um, women's group, which we have coming up on Tuesday. We're doing, we're putting together another group of women at, here in Oklahoma. Um, we're starting that Tuesday, but this one, um, let's see, Tammy is, uh, lives in Idaho. She's from here, but she lives in Idaho and Anne lives in Seattle. They, they came here, I guess they flew to New Orleans first and then drove here. But they came here and, um, and my mentor came to the group. That is the first time that I have seen my mentor in person in about five years because of the pandemic. Um, she takes care of her elderly husband and she could not risk him getting COVID. So we didn't, she had like no one in her home, you know, this whole thing and, so, um, I actually hadn't seen her in person in about five years. So that was amazing that I got to see her. I got to hug her neck and it was just so awesome that we got to do that. And so now that the pandemic is over, it kind of opened the door and she's like, well, let's, 
start meeting again because we used to meet all the time and we would study at her house. We had Bible studies. I have pictures of us studying. Um, one of our Bible study members died five years ago. Her name was Kitty. She was adorable. She wore this uh, wig and she was always going to the ER for things. She was like 85 or 87 and still driving and just a firecracker. And she was one of our Bible study buddies. Well, she passed away. Um, I think it was 2018 or 19. She passed away. So we lost her, but um, we used to study at Cheryl's house all the time until COVID, you know, changed everything in the world as we know um so then we did the strawberry jam so now we're going to start doing this again and doing things on the weekends once in a while where we weren't, weren't doing that for five years but i have been meeting with her we still talk on the phone and we would do zoom and see each other but not in person I have been meeting with her since my son, since my oldest son, I think the first time I met her, he was three or four. So we can't, we're not sure, but it's around 18 years that I've, we've been meeting together that she's been mentoring me and she mentors another friend of mine. And then I guess she mentors Tammy and Anne too. So these are her mentees that we're meeting together that we formed this group. Um, I already knew Tammy because she's a family member of my other friend that is mentored by Cheryl. It's a long story, but um, I didn't know Anne. We're going to start meeting again, and um, and uh, I'm just really excited about that. Okay, so what I'm posting in this next part of the video, um, we have been going to a few different churches because we're trying to find a better Spot where we feel more comfortable, where we feel better than we did prior. We have so many world-class churches around us here. I mean, we have so many churches. So Crossings is one of them, and it is Church of God, and that is an amazing denomination. That's one denomination that I would consider moving my credentials to. Um, Church of God would be amazing, and then we also go to, sometimes we go to the bridge, and that's Assemblies of God, Life Church that we had been going to, that's Evangelical Covenant. So all of these are denominations that I like and that I agree with and that I would move to. Um, but so the other day, so one of, our, one of the churches we go to, it starts really early on Sunday and I'm just like, I need to rest, you know. So we decided to go to Crossings one day. Well... They had John Ortberg, so this was a real treat because um, he's written several books. They had him speaking that day, and so I said, oh my gosh, this is going to be such a treat. This is amazing. We get to hear John Ortberg speak again because we went there about a year ago, and he was speaking. Like We just happened to hit it on that Sunday, so he was speaking. He's written this, The Life You've Always Wanted, Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People, He's, you know, pretty well known. And so he spoke, this was about a week ago, and he spoke on Ruth, Ruth and Boaz. And Ruth is one of the women that I am writing about in my dissertation. And one of the women that Cheryl and I have studied. So Cheryl and I have been studying the women of the Bible for the last 18 years. Ever since I started studying with her, we've been studying them. I have all my notes. I mean, we went from Mary to Abigail to Ruth to, I mean, we have, Judith is one of them. We have studied and we didn't get through all of them um, because our studies were so extensive on each one. But the ones we did get to, um, I have my notes and Ruth is one of them and is one of, you know, one of our favorites, of course. And so John Ortberg was speaking on Ruth. And so it was such a treat. So I took video of um, the worship. Um, and that's one thing I would, I would, I could not go to a church where there's no music and no worship. I just, no, <laughs> that's another story. But um, 
so the, their music and the worship is really good there. And then, and then he spoke and I, I kept taking video because it was so good. So I'm going to try to link the sermon so that you can watch the full sermon if you're interested in John Ortberg's sermon um, here at Crossings. I have been there. Um, I have been to Crossings many times to see other people that I am interested in. Christine Kane is one of them. She's one of my female women of the faith heroes, basically. Um, she is mentored by Joyce Meyer. And Christine Kane is from Australia. She's from the whole Hillsong thing. Um, but I love her. I went and saw her speak in person one time at Crossings. And then Carrie Job, one of my favorite worship leaders, was singing to open for Christine Kane. So I got to see Christine and Carrie Job. I've actually seen Carrie Job a couple of times in person. But um, that was right here. Crossings is it's literally five minutes from my <laughs> from here. And then Life Church has all kinds of amazing people come to speak. Um, so I'm kind of surrounded by all of that. But I, I wanted to post this because um, you know, in lieu of a Bible study, but it is a biblical thing. So if you know the story of Ruth and Boaz, you're going to be blessed by this. I'll try to link um, the whole sermon in the description. And I may link um, a couple other things down there. So keep looking because I might link, you know, a song or something inspirational or another message down there too. So anyway, guys, um, I got to, I've got to get off of here. This is going to be too long. Once again, I will shorten it a little bit, but there's my update. Um, oh, I did talk about going to Scotland and Ireland, um, in one of my videos. And that was a trip that we had done that we had planned. My mentor and I were going to go to Ireland. We went to Israel together. We were going to go to Ireland because, um, I did my ancestry. That's another thing I like to do is the ancestry um, research and and finding out about um, where you come from because of one of my names. Anyway, this is too many stories in one. But when I did my ancestry, I, I came out as 99% European. So um, I, I'll have to look that up. I don't even remember now, but it was you know, several countries in Europe. And I think I had some Irish ancestry. So we were like, let's go to Ireland and, you know, <laughs> dig around. I'm like, okay, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I would like to go there, but she really can't go anywhere right now because of her husband um, she t that she takes care of. So we have put all those trips on hold and everything else. But anyway, um, Maybe one day I'll get to go and do those sort of things, um, which would be amazing. I, I was invited just a week or two ago to something that's happening in Washington, D.C. It's called Esther's Arise or Rising. And um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to go to that. I want to go to that. And I um, looked at tickets and everything. That's in October. But I just don't know if I can make it to that with as much PTO as I have or as little PTO as I have that I'm trying to use for my vacation. I don't know if I can add that also. It's just a one day event, but I'd have to be gone a few days to go to this. It's, it's on the mall in DC and it's all these women and it's, um, it's Lou Engel who is, a very well-known guy, but they're doing this whole thing for women on Esther's Arising, which I'm totally into. I love that. Um, and my good friend is going with two other women. And so I was going to go on this little girl's trip. I don't know if I'll be able to. Um, we'll see. If I, if I do go, I'll vlog it. I don't know that I haven't decided yet if I'm going, but, um, so enjoy the worship and enjoy the message that you hear from John Ortberg and think about the story of Ruth and Boaz. And thanks, guys, and we'll see you in the next video.
judge us or to make us feel bad about ourselves, but it's to turn us back to him, to keep us in line, to keep, keep giving us life. And so maybe that's not repentance for you today. Maybe that's something else, but let's just take a minute to talk to the Lord. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to you. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers the weird dust. You may know in the Old Testament, Abraham is often taken as kind of the hero, the paradigm, the post boy of faith. But Abraham got called by God. Abraham got a promise from God that he and his wife would have a child. Abraham got a covenant in the sanctuary, not wanted, can't go there. There was a rumor in Israel that Moabites actually ate the pets of Israelites. No, I just made that up. That's actually not true. Don't write to me about that. Write to Marty Gross. Anyway, in an ethnocentric world, this unwanted, uncalled for Moabite woman is going to emigrate to Israel. And by the way, don't miss that this moment is her moment of conversion. Your God, she says to Naomi, that is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who has revealed himself in the Hebrew scriptures, will be my God. That's the moment when, that's the hinge point, this is the hinge point of her life, very costly. She says, 
My foundation is not going to be my home, not my culture, not a man, just God. Just he be my God. And if you've never made God your foundation, that God, the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus, this could be your day. And by the way, you will notice she does this, even though she never got a calling from heaven like Abraham did. She never got a promise of blessing like Abraham did. Ruth's a fascinating book in this way. Um, it's not a book of miracles. There's no divine guidance, no burning bush, no still small voice, no angelic visions. Nobody gets miraculously directed. I was talking to some friends about the will of God and how we know the will of God. Sometimes in the Bible, people get a quite extraordinary and supernatural expression. Ruth never does. She's got to make up her mind on all this stuff all by herself, just muddle through life. I don't know. God never called her to leave. Maybe your life is kind of like that. Maybe your experience of God is kind of like that. You hear other people tell amazing stories, but if you're honest about it, you don't. Well, Ruth might be a real good book. She might be a good one. Because what might well be the most daring act of faith, hope, and love in all the Hebrew scriptures is done by a penniless, childless, pagan, uncalled, Moabite widow who leaves even Father Abraham in the dust. Go for it. You know what an amazing story. Two daughters-in-law, orphan, biblical law, just always seeks to give. How can I help you? How can I serve you? In our world, mostly, we don't think about love in that way. We don't write songs about love in that way. We often think about love as desire. I want you. I will sing songs about how much I want you, how much I desire you. We mistake love for desire, which is really about me. And how can I gratify my own heart? So we will use love in ways the Bible never would like. For example, I love Krispy Kreme donuts. Anybody here ever have a Krispy Kreme donut? <laughs> uh, Krispy Kreme donut is one of the greatest proofs of the existence of God in all the world. I've done one right now. I desire a Krispy Kreme donut. I'm going to have one right now. Um, okay. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. <laughs> No, I desire a Krispy Kreme donut. I don't love it. I don't will it's good. If I was that Krispy Kreme donut and I saw me coming, that would not be good news for me. <laughs> what I, want. I want to consume it. I want it to become a part of me. I want to. I want to destroy that precious little donut right like now. Feel bad for it right now. Anyway, to love biblically is. Uh, I, I choose to will and to work for your good. I, I read this last week, a wonderful definition of friendship from a biblical perspective. A friend is somebody who makes the very person available to you. They make their inner being with deep honesty and authenticity somehow available. They will uh, disprivilege themselves in order to that's what it means to befriend someone. As folks who meet with God sometimes do in the Bible and now, as a rabbi did one time when he went to a cross and died for the sins that were betting the farm on love. So by the way, who could you love today? Um, you know, sometimes God speaks to somebody it happens quite often, even though often we may not recognize it, we may not know it, we may never know in this life, but a thought will come. Who could you bless today? Who could you encourage? Who could you serve? Uh, a couple sits on this campus one time years ago, who was poor in ancient Israel, and tried to avoid starving by just picking up leftover grain that belonged to somebody else that the harvesters missed. That's hidden bottom. Naomi used to have a family. She used to own stuff. Uh, Ruth doesn't have to do this. Ruth could go back home and find a man. Not just that, she's a foreigner. She's a Gentile. She is likely to be shunned or rejected or worse. Later on in the book of Ruth twice, it says that men have to be warned. Don't touch her. Don't file her. She's a vulnerable, foreign, mobile woman. But that's what love does. I can help. I can do something. Um, not just that, this is so interesting. <coughs> Let me go and pick up the leftover grain uh, behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. She has reason to hope, she has reason to hope that somebody out there in this strange land is going to look with favor on me, a Moabite, that transcends itself. 
And it is about more than how is this particular circumstance going to turn out. There's a wonderful quote from Václav Havel, you might know him. He was a political prisoner in Czechoslovakia. Uh, he was called the poet of hope, but he had a, he was a, a prisoner for many years, do menial, state imposed labor. After the Czech Republic was freed, he became its first president, from prisoner to president. And somebody asked him, what kept you going in those dark days when you had no idea that the future held anything other than prison and death? And he talked about hope. This is what he wrote. Hope, in this deep and powerful sense, is not the same as joy that things are going well, or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success. But rather, hope is an ability to work for something because it is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed.